Canada invites hundreds of thousands of newcomers to our shore every year, from permanent residents to temporary foreign workers, international students and refugees. As the world absorbs the shocks of this pandemic, what role might immigration play in Canada's recovery and beyond? With us to consider that, we welcome, in the Regal Heights neighborhood of the provincial capital, that's near Dufferin and St. Clair, Senator Ratna Omidvar, a member of the Independent Senators Group. In North York, Ontario, Ravi Jain, partner at Green and Spiegel LLP and past chair of the Canadian Bar Association's Immigration Law Section. And in Waterloo, Ontario, Jenna Hennebry, associate professor at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and co-founder of the International Migration Research Centre, which is at Wilfrid Laurier University. And it's good to have you three with us here tonight here on TVO. I just want to remind everybody as we embark on our discussion here of what the Government of Canada's new targets are. In 2021, the federal government says our target is 401,000 immigrants. Of these, about 60% fall under the economic category, which will help the Canadian economy recover from COVID-19. So say the feds. Ravi, let me get you into this first. What's your view on those targets? Well, I mean, you know, I think it's, it's no surprise that they, they have these targets. I think the government's been clear that they want to bring in this number, um, these numbers of immigrants. But the question is, can they meet the targets? And if you look at what happened last year, I mean, if you had your permanent resident visa issued before March 18, from anywhere in the world, with the U.S. being an exception, um, you know, you could come. But a anyone with a, a permanent resident visa issued after March 18 could not come. And it got to the point where the government was inviting people to signal, OK, are you ready to come? If you are, signal to us. And they've taken that down. So my own view is that I just don't think the government was that keen to bring in a lot of people who maybe didn't have jobs lined up. Uh, I think that there was a concern that um, with the high unemployment rate that maybe it wasn't a good idea. Nothing official has been said, but that's my sense. Uh, but So I think in terms of whether they're going to meet them next year, I think it really depends on COVID. If COVID gets wrestled to the ground, then maybe we'll start to release all the people from last year, frankly, who've been waiting a long time. And we'll start to look at uh, other options that the minister talked about in terms of looking at people who are already here. Senator Omivar, how do you see it? I, I see it slightly differently. I think uh, it's not business as usual. So we have to find different ways of reaching our targets. And the minister indicated in his uh, in his uh, statement to TVO, and I believe that is the right way to go, which is to reach into the communities of temporary workers and others who are already in Canada. They do not have to have the added uh, 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 criteria on health or travel and checks and quarantine because they're already here. And this is something Canadians don't know. In 2019, 1.2 million newcomers arrived in Canada. Of these, only 28 percent were permanent. The rest, the rest are temporary foreign workers, international students, they belong to the temporary, the special labor mobility class, and they include asylum workers. And we're not even talking yet about undocumented, and I don't know the numbers, but let me just suggest, if the minister wants to reach these targets, he can do so if he reaches out to people who are already here. Yeah, let me follow up on that with Jenna Hennebury and just to get a better understanding of, of who we're talking about when we talk about non-high-skilled workers who are making up part of that mix. Who are we talking about there? Yeah, I mean, in Canada, uh, we have uh, entries of over 450,000 temporary migrant workers annually. And uh, a proportion of these are what the government classifies using their occupation classification system as lower skilled jobs uh, that they enter into. And th those numbers are uh, are people that come into, or those people are come into the temporary foreign worker program specifically, which brought in roughly 100,000 entries in 2019. But overall, we're talking about large numbers of people that are in the country that could be doing jobs that are currently in the country doing jobs ranging from uh, working in agriculture to working in the service sector, manufacturing, construction, a whole range of jobs uh, that in, indeed during 2020 were deemed essential. And just as a quick follow-up to that, uh, of all of those jobs you just listed, um, I, I realize this is a vast generalization here, but humor me for a second. What percentage of those jobs are jobs that, Canadi that Canadians who've lived here for a long time don't want to do anymore? 
Well, we don't really have a, a stat on that percentage per se, but I can tell you that there's, uh, as we saw with agriculture in 2020, when there was delayed workers coming into Canada, uh, growers were scrambling to try to get people to fill those jobs, offering $25 an hour uh, if they could attract Canadian workers and failed to do so. So we know that these are jobs that are not, uh, that have long-term issues in terms of uh, filling labor shortages. Okay. Um, Ravi, back to you. What industries, in your judgment, is the Canadian government prioritizing? Just before we go there, I just note that in New Brunswick, I think that they tried to shut down uh, the foreign workers coming into the province, right? And then they realized that they couldn't attract uh, the Canadians and the students and stuff that they wanted to. Um, but sorry, um, the question was, uh, what groups uh, are we attracting? So, I mean, the reality is we don't really go by industry. We go by uh, categories like the family class and skilled workers and that kind of thing. So we bring about 200,000 uh, under um, express entry, uh, which is our system where we um, people you know express an interest. They, they create an online profile and the government comes in and scoops out every few weeks uh, the top, the cream of the crop, and then invites them to apply. So there's express entry. There's a provincial nominee programs where the provinces run different um, economic programs, et cetera. So in that group, there's about 200,000. Then there's about 100,000 that come in under the family class. So parents, grandparents, spouses, uh, common law partners, et cetera. And about 60,000 refugees they're targeting. Uh, and then some other miscellaneous groups uh, that would fall under to a total of 100,000 there. So in, on average, I would say we're about just under two thirds economic. Uh, and one third family or refugee, whereas in the United States, for instance, it's the other way. It's two thirds family and then uh, one third economic. So that's sort of how we how we do things in Canada. And the Express Entry program, how well do you think it works? Well, it's it's a good program. Um, it uh, it basically prevents uh, a backlog from occurring because instead of just uh, accepting fees from everyone and then uh, promising that you're going to process the applications, which led to multi year back backlogs. Uh, the gov actually, the Conservative uh, government brought it in years ago, modeling um, Australia, who modeled New Zealand. And uh, under the Express Energy Program, it works very well because it, it controls the numbers uh, coming in. Okay, Senator Amidvar, uh, tell me if you think it's accurate to say that the current system puts a priority on high skilled workers at the cost of others. I would say that is absolutely the case. Our entire system over the last decade or more has been predicated to searching out the best and brightest talent in the high-skilled fields like STEM, et cetera, to come to Canada. And that's not wrong per se. But what is wrong is that we've taken a one-dimensional look at the labor market instead of looking at it as a whole. And you know, now we know, now after the crisis, we know that yes, we need those engineers and, and, and technical wizards, but they also need their care looked after, they need uh, their food to be picked in farms and put on the table. So this addiction to skilled workers, as, I, as I'm now wanting to call it, has really skewed our sense of the, of the labor market as a whole. Yes, you know, we need those, but we need the others too. And the entire system is geared towards providing opportunities for permanence to people with high skills. And it is not friendly in the same way as it is to high-skilled workers, as it is to low-skilled workers, for transitioning one way or the other from impermanence, temporary work permits that are limited in scope, that limit you to a certain industry, but then allow you at some point to move into permanence. That pathway is extremely fraught. There are a couple of pilots, but again, the government in its wisdom has set the criteria for these pilots so high. Let me just give you an example. There is a special pack pilot for ag workers. Uh, they can apply for permanency under certain conditions. The criteria, the educational criteria, is high school equivalency. As a result, there is, I, I've heard from the government that they've received less than 55 applications to date. Hmm. No wonder. So the whole thing is skewed in a way. And this is a time not to tinker or reset, but possibly to transform. You spoke about express entry, um, um, Steve. Express entry is just an instrument. It's a portal. And if it works for skilled engineers and, and, and people with, with, with graduate degrees, it should work. 
in the same way, it can work for personal support givers and semi-skilled healthcare uh, uh, professionals, as well as migrant workers, if we have the political will to do so. Well, you've anticipated my next question, and let me follow up with Jenna on that. Could we take the express entry approach and use it for the other groups that Senator Omidvar has just referenced? Well, I think it would need a major overhaul to work for any group of applicants beyond those the university or college education uh, without high official language skills and demonstrated settlement funds, which is how it's worked thus far. Uh, it also requires people to have had work experience in Canada that is 12 months in duration at minimum. And so most uh, um, market workers in agriculture, for example, wouldn't qualify for the express entry as it's currently organized. And the pilots that the senator mentioned uh, also have excluded workers that have been coming to Canada for 20 years under the seasonal agriculture worker program because sure. they failed to meet that bar. And so overall, mm -hmm. I think it has op it has a, it could work as a mechanism, but all the criteria would have to be modified and changed to recognize that, um, that it's not about uh, having a university degree that's going to enable you to uh, participate and integrate into the labor market. It's, do you have the skills that are needed in our economy right now? And absolutely, we need people with those skills. All right. Well, uh, Senator Romivar, let me go back to you on that. It doesn't sound as if you could just take the template of the express entry program and apply it to all these other groups. Uh, Jenna's made it sound a little more complicated than that. Fair to say? It's fair to say the criteria would have to be shifted. But the structure of the program, which is people enter into a room, they apply, they pay the fees, they, they, wait, and they wait for the pick, and then you go on to the next cohort. That system could apply. Clearly, of course, the criteria would have to be changed. I would want, I mean, who would want mm. to set criteria uh, for people working in the ag fields at the same level as we would for high-skilled workers? That, that, of course, makes com complete uh, sense to do that. Okay. If I could jump in. Yeah, Robert, Sorry, go ahead. Steve. Yeah, if I, yeah, actually, um, I just wanted to make one slight correction. Uh, express entry doesn't actually require that you have uh, a Europe Canadian uh, experience. There are um, yeah. several different programs within express entry. There's the federal skilled trades. Uh, there's the federal skilled worker program, which f from which you could enter express entry having no Canadian work experience, but actually work experience from abroad. And then there's the Canada experience class. So there's three kind of streams into it. And then frankly, the provincial nominee programs give you an automatic 600 points where the threshold for express entries in the 400s so right there you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have no problem getting in so they could theoretically uh to you know to, to borrow from what uh, senator Ahmedbar is saying uh and what you're suggesting steve they could actually uh create a stream uh a, a new program with an express entry where they do a specific draw um for that particular program which is what they currently do uh, they actually do occasionally do specific draws for the Canada Experience class uh, or the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So they could actually, and the Federal Skilled Trade Program. So they could actually create a new program which would tap into low skill workers and then do a draw. And by the way, we do have a caregiver program which they've entirely revamped uh, such that, and this is what Senator Almedvar was saying, there are these sort of pilots. And, and again, I would say that it's not um, it's not working as quickly as it needs to. There's a huge demand in Canada, and they should be. But they are at least they are at least instead of doing it the other way, bringing them in as foreign workers, and then sometimes they 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 never qualify for the permanent residence criteria and can never transition to permanent residence. Now we flipped that on its head and we said, okay, we're now going to look at whether you qualify for permanent residence before we give you what's going to be a sectoral open work permit as a caregiver. All right. In the midst of Jenna's last answer, she referenced international students, and I want to pick up the conversation there. And uh, I guess to get our discussion started here, let's quote something from the Toronto Star. Uh, this was in a recent edition. The tuition fees of international students are generally three to four times above what domestic students pay. The students contribute more than $21 billion annually to the Canadian economy, and international education has become a default pathway for immigration to Canada. As I pointed out when we had just talked to the minister, uh, that $21 billion annually uh, is the case when the students are here. We know a lot of them are not here, of course, because of COVID-19. But for those who are in Canada, uh, and Robbie, why don't you pick up on this? For those who are in Canada, the 18-month work permit extension that was just announced by the feds, how adequate to the task do you think that is? 
Well, it's a great initiative because people come here as students and they expect to be able to get Canadian work experience. And, you know, because of the recession, because of the pandemic, they haven't been able to. And so they're extending it 18 months, which is wonderful. But there's a major problem with respect to international students in my mind. You know, we bring in 640,000 now. I mean, 10 years ago, we brought in just over 200,000. That is a massive increase in the number of international students. And for sure, the community colleges and universities benefit. Absolutely. Uh, and they, you know, there's Canadian employment that comes out of that. But it's on the backs of these, you know, international students who are paying exorbitant fees. And they expect to be able to get immigration. But if you look at the numbers that are on the work permits that you get when you graduate, remember, 640 coming in, there's only 100,000 that are on these work permits. And there's only 30,000 spots uh, as of, in terms of 2019 under the Can Experience class that I referenced earlier. Only 30,000 came under the Can Experience class. And some of those would have come directly on work permits, not come through the school system. And sure, there are some that come under the provincial nominee programs. But the point is that in terms of the, the room in the levels planning, even the, even the expanded levels planning, is not going to cut it in terms of all these students coming in. So I, I really have concerns about, about the students coming in. And, you know, they're paying all these fees. They're paying a lot of you know, a lot of, uh, you know, immigration consultants are getting lucrative commissions, you know, uh, from the colleges. Now, I don't know of any lawyers uh, because it's a conflict of interest in my mind to send them in and they and they send them to these private colleges for which you cannot even get the coveted work permit afterwards and can't transition to permanent residence. So uh, I think that, you know, I have deep concerns about the numbers we're bringing in. It's not all a good news story is all I'm saying. All right, let's get some feedback to that. Uh, Jenna Henbury, do you want to weigh in on whether we're not actually doing right by these international students at the end of the day? Well, I think, uh, you know, Remy pointed to the stats, which indicate that very few, uh, in terms of proportion of the international students, are able to access the pathways for permanent residency as they stand. So I think more needs to be done to, to enhance those pathways and recognize that students have come. They've uh, ended up uh, working in our economy as well. They often come uh, leaving their families behind. Uh, and so I think it's come, they've, they've put a great deal of uh, effort into coming to Canada and a chosen Canada, and we want to attract them and want them to stay. So I think more needs to be done to, to adjust the system uh, to expand the numbers of entry from that category. Yeah, Senator Romidvard, it's a great deal for us because, of course, they pay so much more than domestic students to come to our post-secondary institutions. But having said that, are we doing right by them? I think Ravi and Jenna have pointed out the failings and our weaknesses in our system. I personally know of a number of international foreign students whose permits have not been renewed or whose work permits are lagging. So I think the government does need to put the pedal to the metal uh, and, and, and facilitate these uh, this paperwork. However, I will say that there's another aspect to this conversation, and that is the reliance of Canada's post-secondary education in institutes on foreign students to meet their bottom line. And this is serious. If those foreign students do not arrive in the numbers that we, we predict that they will arrive in, and that is a whole different question, our post-secondary educational institutions will need some serious uh, help from different levels of government. Um, and I would also say that economies of whole small towns in the Maritimes, the Maritimes have done incredibly well with international foreign students, and the, the economy of, of whole communities is structured around their presence, and, you know, that is going to be another unintended outcome. And finally, I would note, you know, Canada has long aspired to compete better with Australia, the UK, and the US on foreign students, and we've never been able to do so. And then, voila, we got President Trump, and what we're experiencing is, in a sense, the, the, the last uh, gasp of the Trump bump of students coming to Canada, as opposed to choosing the United States. And we know that that is going to change in the next four years. Okay. So we will face competition on all fronts. Right, right. Ravi, can you pick up on that? Because, yeah, the Trump bump is coming to an end. And, uh, for example, I know Cape Breton University in the Maritimes, I mean, half their students, fully half their students are international students. And if because of COVID and if because of a Trump bump or whatever, uh, they just stop coming, that's, uh, I mean, the implications for that post-secondary institution are quite ominous. Uh, what are you seeing out there in terms of uh, what, what could derail uh, our, post our, our ability to attract post-secondary students from other countries? 
Well, for sure. I mean, Canada pivoted uh, when uh, when America, you know, turned to this Trump turned to, you know, created this America first strategy. We had deliberate programs, uh, you know, for sure in terms of international students, but also in terms of, you know, categories for work permits, IT workers. We, we created entire programs to attract people. So uh, I guess my concern, though, is that, you know, I agree with Senator Almodovar. We need to we need to fund and support these communities that have been so reliant on them. But my concern is that, you know, a lot of students that I talk to, their parents have paid their life savings for them to be able to come to Canada. The pressure on them is enormous. We know of a few suicides that have happened because the pressure has been too much. You know, sometimes they're um, they're coming and they're just they're not able to do well academically. Um, they're not vetted properly. Uh, again, they're using these immigration consultants, and and I just find that uh, it's it's very sad. And I think that the, we need to shift. Either we create more room. Uh, as, as has been suggested, I think that that's a good idea in terms of making sure that those who are coming here and spending this vast sums of money uh, have a pathway to immigration. Uh, but we also, you know, we just need to think about uh, the sheer number that we're bringing in, because I don't know that we can all of a sudden increase immigration to like 600,000. Uh, I don't know that's going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Okay, Senator Romivar, let me get you to weigh in on something else. Uh, last month, Canada be began prioritizing permanent residence applications from refugee claimants working in Canada's healthcare sector. How do you think that's going? Well, I mean, if, let's start with thinking about how Canadians think, because politics is an expression of, of public will. Uh, the latest polls that have come out from Enveronics and others suggest that Canadians have, have, they've always been supportive of immigration, but the new numbers are frankly surprising in, in their support for immigration, uh, their understanding of the contribution of immigrants, immigrants to the economy, even in parts of the country which were always more unfriendly, let's say, to immigrants. So now we have uh, an offer. Uh, and a program out to asylum seekers who are who have worked during the COVID crisis. It's a pragmatic uh, strategy. We need those numbers. We we need their applications. We need to approve them so that we can reach our target of uh, 411,000 this year. And personally, you know, I think if the government is going to meet these targets, it's going to have to dig deeper into the into the community of asylum seekers who are already here. They don't have to travel. Many are already working. Many are, in fact, working in the service economy, which we know is not temporary. It's not going away. So I think it, if, if they can make it work politically, it would be uh, a win for them uh, to open up uh, permanent landing streams for more asylum seekers who are already here. It could also, however, on the, on the opposite side, it could uh, uh, constitute a pull factor for more asylum seekers, and, and the system is already quite stretched, I will say. So, I mean, there are, you have to weigh the pros and cons of, of, the, of a political decision you make. I'm just glad I'm not the minister making that decision. Uh, I would advise him, though, to look very seriously at this option. Okay, Jenna, you want to follow up on that? Is there a strong case to be made that this kind of option ought to be extended to refugees beyond those who are working in health care? Indeed, I think uh, I think we need to be thinking about uh, a whole range of refugee claimants with a variety of skill levels. Uh, but I also think it should be expanded to include those that are here in other with other permits. Um, we need more of such pathways to regularization. Um, so not just among claimants, among precarious any any migrant with precarious status, in fact because uh, those that are here on work permits without opportunities to stay legally in Canada, without those pathways, they're either going to return to countries uh, of origin and therefore uh, their investments and our investments towards their uh, integration and contribution to the economy are, are lost, uh, and, and it, or uh, they might try to obtain another work permit, uh, which may heighten their precarity. And in many cases, they have no other option but to overstay their permit. And then we're growing our undocumented migration uh, in Canada. And I think uh, we need to think really carefully about creating a system that's set up to fail. Uh, if, if we've created expanded the numbers of opportunities for people to come temporarily, but then not matched it equally with opportunities and pathways for, for residency. Ravi, let me get you to uh, put your yeah. views on the record on this next angle, which is uh, the recent reopening of the parents' and grandparents' lottery system. How would you characterize uh, that move by the government? 
Well, I think it's uh, in a way a bit of a political decision. I think that um, you know there's always pressure from the different ethnic communities across the country uh, for this particular program. Uh, it's wildly popular. Uh, I think the demand is about 100,000 a year. Uh, there are many immigrants that expect to be able to bring their parents uh, when when they come here, um, but you know the the actual levels plan uh, allows for about twenty thousand a year. So last year, due to COVID, uh, there were about ten thousand that were invited. Uh, this year, there's going to be thirty thousand. Um, so, you know, I think that you, when you think about this program, uh, yes, there are. Um, there are cultural reasons why we want to have parents and grandparents coming. I mean, you know, they, they instill values in their grandkids. Uh, also, there are some economic reasons. I mean, uh, people, you know, may say, well, look, you know, bringing in older people at a time when, you know, we have an aging population and we have a lot of older people accessing the healthcare system, do we really want to be doing that? And I think that's why we keep the numbers low. But on the other hand, in my experience, when you bring in grandparents, uh, what happens is they may take care of the grandkids, and then the parents of the little kids uh, who brought them in are able to then both work and, and contribute to the tax base. So I, I don't think you can look at it purely in terms of, you know, there's non-economic reasons to bring them in. But having said that, I think that I understand why the government is not sort of just opening the door wide open and, and allowing just all those who want to come in to enter. Okay. Senator Omivar, uh, another program I'd like you uh, to weigh in on, and that is the Municipal Nominee Program, which essentially tries to get people to come to Canada and then not have everybody living in the sort of uh, most densely populated parts of the country. Let's get people out to uh, less sparsely or more sparsely populated parts of the country. H how well is that working in your view? Well, it's really new, and I think it's a really smart uh, uh, innovation. I... I have to uh, credit the department and the minister for trying new things. Um, the municipal nominee program is, is smart because at, at its heart, integration is a local experience, not a national experience. Immigration may well be a national experience or, a, or, or, or something like that. But I, when you think of the municipal nominee program and its objective to uh, ensure that people choose less uh, dense parts of our country. I think it also presents an opportunity. There is no need, there is no reason why the municipal nominee program could not be embraced in rural agricultural communities where the rural farmers or, or, or farm businesses get together with the mayor and the board of trade and put forward a proposal to settle uh, and to nominate four families, let's say, or 10 families or whatever it is, as if we can stretch the current imagination of the municipal nominee program to extend to municipal settlement in high need uh, areas of low skilled work, then I think it really becomes a robust mechanism uh, to uh, enable us uh, to get people to where the jobs are and... Uh, the jobs to the people. Right. Ravi, how well do you think it's working? Well, as, as Senator Amidvar said, it's a very new program. I think that there are, you know, there are all these different programs that they're coming up with, the rural program, the nor northern program, municipal program. They're all good ideas. I mean, anything we could do to sort of uh, move people around to, to areas where they wouldn't otherwise settle, um, you know, uh, they often will pick, you know, Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Montreal, um, Edmonton, certain, you know, some of the larger cities. Uh, and I think that well, if the government can, can, can do things to move people around, I think it's, I'm all for it. Everybody seems to be all for this, Jenna, but the question of whether or not, if, for example, you come from, let's say, a very densely populated part of, I'll just pick any country out of the blue here, India, and then somehow the notion that you're going to feel comfortable moving into a very sparsely populated part of Canada, you know, that's just not going to be on for, for many people. Do you think this can work? Well, sure, I think it can work to some extent. I think uh, we know that uh, communities are, are uh, in need of immigration and, and can welcome immigrants regardless of where they come from. But what's needed is, is investment in the settlement infrastructure in those in those areas. Uh, local uh, or integration happens locally, yes, but it, it happens with support. It happens with investment in, uh, in community-level supports, uh, everything from translation to, to language training that's needed in order to welcome immigrants in those communities. So it needs to, to be matched with investments in, in that regard as well. Okay. We're less than five minutes to go here, and I'd love to get all three of you to weigh in on this 
you know, this question that I suspect you all hear from time to time, and I asked the minister this question as well, so let me get your views on it, maybe a minute and change to each of you. I'm sure there are Canadians watching this right now who are thinking, you know, immigration just ought not to be the priority of this country right now. Uh, we got people with problems here. Um, we're spending a heck of a lot of money as a federal government and provinces to a lesser extent trying to deal with the, with the uh, after effects of COVID-19. Uh, we, our focus should be on the folks here as opposed to the folks who are not yet here but are coming. Okay, let's get your three takes on that. Jenny, you want to start? Sure. Um, you know, Canada's population is aging. Uh, the number of working age Canadians for every senior is dropping. It's going to be around 2.7 in 2030. This means the working age population is shrinking. And uh, we absolutely need immigration uh, to account for the net increase in Canada's labor force. And it can't just be with temporary migrant workers used to fill this gap uh, in, a, in a second rate, uh, second tiered way where they don't have the same access to services and transition pathways to permanent residency. It's vital that we recognize that skill shortages aren't just at high level. They're also uh, in skills, uh, in jobs that, and cooks and cashiers and farm workers. We need people to fill those jobs over the long term. Rabbi Jane, your view. Well, I think that, you know, bringing in people, sometimes, you know, it's a matter, a matter of family reunification. So when people say Canadians first, you know, what about when you're bringing in your loved one, when, when you're bringing in your, your spouse or your common law partner or your boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, which we're now allowing to happen, by the way, under, under, because of COVID restrictions. So I think that we need to to think about that. I, I would totally agree with what uh, Professor Henry said. Um, you know, and the minister talked about this too. Uh, we have an aging population, low birth rate. Uh, all labor force growth comes from immigration. Uh, I also think, um, you know, as was noted in, a, in the Globe recently, Immigration is a form of economic stimulus. And look what happened in the last recession. We didn't, we didn't shut our borders down, uh, far from it. So we need, we've got a heck of a lot of debt that we've been piling on. So we need the economic stimulus that immigrants bring. Uh, and by the way, the one thing the minister didn't talk about, and we haven't talked about yet, is the fact that we have a very dismal number of people coming in as entrepreneurs and investors. Look at the startup visa program. There were 500 people that came in 2019. Last year, there were 255. That is pathetic. I mean, we are competing with the rest of the world for people who can start businesses. There's a there's trillion dollars of businesses of people who came as immigrants years ago, you know, created convenience stores, et cetera. They're all retiring. Their kids are professionals. They don't want to do that anymore. What are we going to do with all these businesses? So that's one thing we have not talked about yet, but I think that the minister needs to seriously think about that. Last minute to the independent senator. Thank you, Steve. I think immigration is all about looking after citizens in the here and now and in the tomorrow, as Ravi and Jenna have pointed out. The very, our, our very citizens today would be worse out would be worse off without the immigrants today and the streams of immigrants that are supposed to be coming in. You know, ask any landlord in Toronto how they're feeling right now without with the with the lower number of immigrants. One in three businesses, as the minister said, is led by an immigrant. Many of these are small businesses that provide uh, you know goods and services in many ways in our neighborhoods and our community. You know, the labor market, the demographics, uh, the future of our country is all predicated to a very large extent on, on a successful immigration policy. You know, it's not only, the Canada's success is not only uh, about immigration, but immigration is a very, very large part of this narrative that we want to successfully plot out for the future, not just today, but I'm looking into the turn of the century, and I like uh, the idea that by uh, the turn of uh, of this, this century, Canada will not be 37 million people, but 100 million people. That's the need, the scale we need to think about to secure our future prosperity. And the only way to get there is through immigration. And I look forward to having this group on in 80 years to come back on this program <laughs> and continue the conversation to see whether or not these turn-of-the-century predictions, in fact, come true. Senator Ratna Omid Var, it's great to have you on our program again. Ravi Jain, the partner at Green and Spiegel LLP. Jenna Henbury at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and Wilfrid Laurier University. Thanks to the three of you, and stay safe out there. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Thank you.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.